Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Open Book, Asian Pacific American Heritage. I'm Tish Callamer, Community Engagement Manager here at the, the Gail Borden Public Library District. I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Vetter, our Community Engagement Coordinator, and we're very happy to have you join us in a celebration of Asian American Pacific Islander heritage. And we have some fine members of our community who are graciously and generously sharing their stories of growing up Asian American and what their heritage means to them. We're going to start by just having them introduce themselves briefly. Uh, let's start with Junaid Afif. Hi, everybody. My name is Junaid, and uh, I live it here in Elgin. Um, I have uh, lived in Elgin for eight years, but have been a part of the Elgin community through the library and uh, uh, where we live uh, for 20 years now. Uh, I'm an attorney uh, practicing law for almost 30 years. Uh, the last uh, two years, uh, I've been an administrative law judge in the state of Illinois and uh, I'm really excited to be a part of anything associated with Tish. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Ling, Ling Lo. Hi there. Um... Like you, I'm also very happy to be a friend of Tish and be part of anything that she's involved in. So thank you for the opportunity to come back this year. Um, I have been an Elgin resident for I think 10 years now. Um, I came to this country about 31 years ago for my university studies and I've been fortunate to be accepted by this country and I continue with my career here. I'm an analyst and uh, with McCain Foods, and this is a new job that I just um, got an offer letter on today. So I'm really excited. Uh, McCain Foods is um, frozen fries that you can find in the um, frozen food aisle. So support us, support me. Um, but anyway, um, I'm now um, a citizen of this country, so I cannot be happier to be part of the API community. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Uh, next, we'll go to Matthew, Matthew Munasis. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. There's, we've been saying Munessis since I since I grew up. So, um, but in the Philippines with the uh, with the Matthew, children. if I may interrupt, would you mind turning up your volume? Of I course. think we're having trouble hearing you. Let's try. Give me one moment. My apologies. I keep it really low because I use Zoom to teach all of my students. So. Yeah, it needs to be bumped up just having a little a bit. <laughs> having saxophone go through and blow kids' ears, eardrums out is rarely a positive thing. Um, is this better? A little bit, but if you can bump it up some more, that would be great. Okay. I can also, you know what? I'll just bring the mic closer too. That helps. That works too. Um, one more time, I'll bump it up a tiny bit. And then hopefully, oh, input, that would explain. There we go. Okay, is that better? That's better, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, yeah, I was saying um, with the tilde, you could say munesis, munesis. Um, we'll, we'll take either one as long as it's not horrifically mispronounced, which I've gotten a lot. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm sure we all have <laughs> to some extent. Um, I've been living in South Elgin, in the Elgin area, uh, for almost 10 years, nine years. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we tried to, to become patrons of the library pretty early. Uh, we haven't been there in person in a while. I have two young children, uh, five and two. So we're just kind of trying to wait it out to make sure things are as safe as possible for the youngest one. And then we plan on resuming our in-person library activities. And um, I'm just grateful to be able to share with everybody else and uh, be in this, be part of this community in this panel. So thank you again. Thank you. Next we'll go to Steve, Steve Moon. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Steve Hoshik Moon. I am the director of Elgin programs at the Grand Victoria Foundation. Uh, the Grand Victoria Foundation has been supporting social service and arts and cultural organizations in the Elgin area and across the state. Uh, 
I have a little bit of history with Elgin in the mid 80s to early 90s. Um, my folks actually own Clock Tower uh, Cleaners, a laundry mat right there in the plaza. Um, so I spent you know, some of the years of my adolescence um, being a dutiful immigrant son and cleaning up, um, mopping floors and cleaning detergent off the washing machines and eating a lot of cheesy bread and getting paid in Hawaiian punch, um, which was a real <laughs> treat for me at that point. Um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to share the space with the panelists and um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Laura Robertson, please introduce yourself. Oh, you're muted, Laura. Okay, can you hear Here me now? <laughs> oh, yes. awesome. The you microphone gotcha. was muted. Okay, thank you. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, I am Laura Robertson. I am author, coach, trainer, um, author of $40 and a Dream. And I have a business in Elgin, as well as I run two nonprofit organizations, um, AAPI organizations. I have been in Elgin, um, practically grew up in Elgin all my life, um, came here as a refugee child um, at two years old. So I grew up in Elgin, I moved away and back a couple of times, but here to stay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And thank you all for those wonderful introductions. And let's start off with our first question tonight. How has your culture and heritage shaped you? Who wants to grab that one first? Laura, you're on. You want to want to go ahead and tackle it? Okay. Sure. So my family's from Laos, and uh, we are very, very big on family culture, community. That was the only way that we were able to survive coming here as refugees. Um, many of the other families that came along with our struggle, the way that we came, were not blood related, but we've embraced that family. And till this day, they're aunts and uncles. And um, so with our, with that being said, that's a huge part of my life. Um, you know, everyone in our community, if we see someone, they say that they're Laos and we're, or if they're Lao, then we're like, okay, hi, auntie, hi, uncle, you know, so that's just, that's just the way that our culture is because of our struggle and, and the village, you know, the, the heritage and everything um, from what we were brought up. It's just a very close and had it not been for that um, tight knit community that we had in Elgin, you know, we would not be where we are today. Great. And I, I noticed you're wearing a beautiful garment tonight. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> so this is um, one of our tradition. Uh, uh, yeah, we wear this, the women, you know, and men, we have some for men as well. But anytime that we have events or cultural things, we wear this um, very beautiful thing. And uh, it's just uh, one of our attires, our custom, custom attires. Lovely. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, how about Steve? Steve, how has your culture and heritage shaped you? Uh, I find myself these days thinking of everything through um, the lens of being a parent of a four-year-old and a young person who's about to engage um, with many different institutions, be in different social settings. Um, and so, you know, when I think about that and reflect on my life, I mean, culture, of course, had an essential role. Um, as Laura mentioned, you know, it's about a resilience. It's about survival. Um, in some ways, something sacred in other ways, maybe also reflecting some things that aren't great <laughs> about our cultures as well. Um, but the interesting thing that I reflect on is um, how much it was meaningful, you know, as far as family and community. Um, but then at the same time, getting messages that our culture is the other um, and simultaneously kind of navigating that. So something that you find great strength in, but at the same time, you know, when you're at school or you're out, you know, in public, also seeing through media messages that our culture is not to be celebrated um, and it is to be othered and marginalized. And so uh, growing up, you know, uh, navigating that is, is something. And I, I see a message around uh, telling folks what our heritage is. Well, uh, I'm an immigrant from Korea. I was actually born in Singapore. 
Um, but for all intents and purposes, I'm, a, I'm like a 1.99 generation. I came here when I was very, very young. Um, so yeah, I, I reflect a lot on what my daughter um, as a Korean, Colombian, Filipina is going to face as she continues to get older and the beauty and power of that, but also some of the struggles she's likely going to face as well. Thank well I think we need to go to Ling, who's your uh, fellow Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but fellow Singaporean. I'm not sure if you still remember any of the Singapore slang. I'm not sure when you left Singapore, but um, Singapore tied me. So the Singapore culture and heritage has really uh, followed me, especially very strongly the last few years when I was able to find fellow Singaporeans in the area um, through Facebook, thankfully. Um, all the good things about that. Um, we get together to cook a lot of our native foods. It was really hard when I came here 30 years ago when there was no not much of an internet presence, right? Or at all of an internet presence. And it was really hard to find recipes and cook the food that we, we are able to do so. And also there were not a lot of Asian stores for us to even get our ingredients. We had to, any trip we make back home, we just bring back you know, luggage full of ingredients. And some of them will be um, confiscated at custom because they just won't allow certain ingredients in. Um, but but in recent years, it's just been really easy. And thankfully, moving to Illinois after having lived in seven states, it makes it even easier because it's so diverse here. That we're able to get so much Asian uh, food and fares, and you know, and they're just springing up more and more around the suburbs. Um, but like Steve, how I'm viewing my culture and heritage now is really through the eyes of my American-born mixed um, kid. He's seven years old. He's in Chinese class right now. I don't get into a habit of speaking Mandarin at home, but you know my husband, who's um, Caucasian American from Alabama, you know he's always the one who's reminding me speak to him in Mandarin, speak to him in Mandarin. And I say, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. And I'll just you know pepper it in. But he goes to weekly class in Schaumburg for that, and and um, you know he's fifty percent Chinese, so I it, it's really up to me to to remind him of his heritage, and through him I've, I'm reminding myself as well to carry on. The, the good, you know, and of, of our culture, because that, like you said, there's, there are the negative connotations and negative, you know, implications and negative traits of our, our culture as well that I'm trying to enlighten him on, but not to practice them. For instance, always yelling. My mom is always yelling at me to do things. You know, it's always like that loud voice, right? <laughs> Laura, Laura is <laughs> <laughs> and it's so different in this culture where things are more encouraging and you don't nag it so much and you know you just nurture them but in my culture it's constantly I yell at you because I love you um so <laughs> it's just a lot of you know self-awareness and mindfulness that I'm practicing right now as a parent of you know of uh, to a mixed child I'm trying to in, you know, impart the, the positive traits of our culture so you love, but you love loudly sometimes when you're yelling, right? <laughs> Ling, thank you. And when you, you mentioned the cuisine earlier, we were fortunate enough to be able to do a cooking segment with you last year for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And, and I'll tell everybody, you're a wonderful cook and your food is delicious. So thank you so much for sharing on that. And let's go to Matthew next. Matthew, same questions. How has your culture and heritage shaped you? Um, that's it's that's a very um, present question. Um, you know, we you we joked about self promotion and and doing that shamelessly. Although there's always a certain self uh, kind of uh, insecurity about that, but. Um, a thing that I've been doing over the past several several years, um, inspired by musicians that um, I, I've gravitated towards and I'm inspired by, um, I, I've been on my own journey to to more deeply uh, connect, reconnect with my Filipino heritage. Um, you know, I I'm a first generation. I I realized pretty emotionally like a, a couple months ago that I was the the first in my Lulu's line uh, of his children that was born in the United States, um, which is is kind of, um, 
you know, it, it, it was just, it was truly an emotional thing to realize that uh, in some ways I'm, I'm kind of the standard bearer for my family or, or the, the first steps. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure this is similar for anybody who's first generation or, um, or who, who, yeah, I mean, first generation of immigrants, right? Um, there's a certain level of, of assimilation that, that everybody tries to encourage on their child so that they don't feel other, uh, like we've talked about, you know, at school and in, and in any type of social scenario. So, you know, um, we, we didn't necessarily hide all of our traditions. We, we kept them very private, though. Um, but, yeah, it, I mean, it shaped me through, you know, some of the, some of the more positive things where, you know, we, we try to be very generous and giving and, and caring of other people, understanding of, of what other people's situations and circumstances might be. Um, but also some of the negatives, you know, I carry a lot of um, self-doubt and self-criticism, which I've talked about with other, other first-generation Filipino friends of mine where, you know, like with the record that I just did, um, the person that I asked to produce is also first-generation Filipino, Filipino-American, and um, but he's 10 years older than me and he's been a great mentor, but, um, you know, there's, there's that, uh, yeah, self-doubt, insecurity about everything you do because, you know, there's the stereotype that nothing we do is good enough. We always have to do extra to, to get ahead. And, um, one of the things that, that he helped me with, with is realizing that there's that there's a lot of value and that we have to be the ones to to uh, kind of cheerlead for our own culture, for our own voices, um, because nobody else will if we if we don't lead the charge on that. So um, it has shaped me that in in that way and. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a laundry list of things, right? But um, yeah, I mean, similar to Ling and Steve, you know, I, I've been viewing it also as a parent. You know, I've been, my, my dad did not teach me uh, Cebuano because he didn't want me to have an accent and he, did, and he wanted me to be able to assimilate. And so like one of the things that I've been doing similar to like what Ling mentioned is I've been learning Cebuano, I've been learning Bisaya and trying to teach my kids. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been a way to deepen that as well. Um, so, yeah. That's cool. That's pretty powerful. Teaching your, your, your kids the, the language. Yeah. <laughs> and teaching myself and, and the yourself. They're better than me sometimes. <laughs> Little kids always learn that <laughs> stuff uh, faster, don't they, than we do. That's great. Just, Thank you, Matthew. I just wanted to say that um, pertaining to yelling as a way of saying, I love you. I have a, a mug that says, I'm not yelling, I'm Dominican. <laughs> so I think it's just the, awesome. uh, it's the ethnic mom thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see, we still have Junaid to answer the first question. Junaid, um, how has your culture and heritage shaped you? Um, so I'm uh, an immigrant from India. Uh, I came to the United States when I was four years old, uh, and that was 48 plus years ago. So um, I think uh, for, for me and for my family, um, cultural heritage played a, you know, anchoring role because uh, we came to the northwest suburbs of Chicago, uh, what, um, like in 73. And um uh, you know, the world was very different and this community was very different in 1973. And I don't want to spend a lot of time being negative, but um, uh, like the bulk of my childhood is, uh, uh, you know, colored by negative experiences um, in this community with racism. Um, so knowing that uh, we had a community of other 
uh, families who are also immigrants from India provided a safe space and an anchor space. And uh, uh, really, um, when I think back on my childhood, you know, the the happiest memories and the things that I think about in my childhood, they're, they're not uh, school-based or community-based in the sense of the neighborhoods that I grew up in. They're based in the memories of whatever social events and civic events and like uh, things that were created in different people's homes over, over the years when we were growing up around food and music and, uh, and culture. So uh, it's it's really served as a as an anchor, and uh, uh, I, I I think without having that foundation or that uh, anchor, uh, I wouldn't have any positive memories. Thank if you. I That's could, very interesting. Yes, if Matthew. I could add to that. Um, that brought up very vivid memories for me, also. Um, yeah, I mean, similarly, and again, I feel like everybody has had this experience. Um, the the times when when I felt most at home, which again is hilarious, because I'm born and raised in America. I was born in Maryland. I was raised in Illinois. Um, but the most vivid, clear memories that I have are of being at Filipino parties with other Filipino kids, other you know my dad's doctor friends and or or you know a new filipino priest would come to town because they you know they just transferred over and we're having all of you know all of his old classmates and 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 uh and friends over and yeah i, th I think that that's a pretty maybe not universal but there's something very similar and shared about that about all those experiences like like he was mentioning but i i didn't mean to it was just that struck such a chord with me because it was very clear, very, you know, n very little was was based around school. It's just all about a cultural community. Mm. Oh, please yeah, feel that's... free to to jump in. Um, it might be a little messy if we talk over each other, but that's OK. That's the Zoom environment. Um, we certainly welcome the the opportunity to to have a conversation. So so don't be shy to comment on on each other's uh, statements and stories. Um, are we so ready to move on? To, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> similar to you know what Matthew had just mentioned as well. Um, it was a little difficult for me too growing up as a refugee in Elgin. Uh, and all I remember were the positive memories of the gatherings and the cultural traditions that we all had. School was really, uh, I did have a negative experience and I shared that as well in my book. And it was just the bullying. I went to Garfield Elementary School and I had a fifth grade teacher um, tell me that I didn't deserve this country. She yelled at me and told me that I didn't deserve this country. And at the time, I didn't even know what racism was. And I just knew that that was bad to say, you know? And, and so um, I went to my principal's office, Mrs. Jones at the time. Um, and I'm like, am I in trouble? I'm like, this is what the teacher told me. And it was just for singing. She yelled at me for singing, it was after music. So I went home to my dad and I, I, I let him know what ha happened to me at school. And my dad, the way that he explained racism to me in fifth grade was, you know, honey, we're in America. There are some Americans who love us, but there are some that don't like us because we have dark hair, you know, because we have black hair. And that's the way that to a child, how my father explained racism to me. Wow. So it's just, yeah, it was like the constant bullying and Chinese, Japanese. I was getting spitballs thrown at me. I was getting my chairs pulled underneath me. I was getting, I hated recess because I didn't have friends. And I just sat on the side of the stairs um, just watching everyone play. And when I would try to play jump rope or try to play things with the other kids, no, you're Chinese, Japanese, Chickadees, look at me. Like they'll put their eyes back and they'll tell me, get away from me. And so I would just find myself, you know, just 
sitting there on the sideline every recess. And I would beg the principal, like, can I just sit with you in here and draw for you? You know, and that, I think that's how I became really good with like art and stuff. I would sit and help the principal, Mrs. Jones out during my recess, or I would try to volunteer in different things. It wasn't until um, I finally had another Laotian um, classmate that moved from another state that I finally had like some friends and then, of course, you know, I got a little bit older than I had more friends, but it was the constant bullying is what I remember from like my elementary school and the racism from my fifth grade teacher. I, I just have to jump in and say that, you know, Laura, I, I can, I, I, I remember so vividly now, like when you mentioned that, that my entire childhood was uh, uh, marked by that kind of experience to the point that by the time I got to high school, uh, maybe one of the reasons why I did better than, you know, I might have is because uh, I felt so um, isolated. And the one the one period where your identity or like, uh, or, or your lack of like, um, connection with others was most vivid was lunchtime. And so I spent my four years of high school in the library, I asked for and thankfully got permission to be able to skip lunch and uh, just go to the library ostensibly because I wanted to study, but it was because I didn't want to sit by myself. I just want to hop in and just thank you all for sharing what you're sharing. And I, you know, I had a similar experience. Um, I don't need to repeat it because it, you know, it's everybody's story, you know, I have elements of that as well. So I just want to acknowledge that. And I think you know, it's interesting for us, you know, like this is part of the story of our heritage and our narratives that will pass down to our children. And, you know, we hope our children won't face, but we know there's also a good chance they will also face some of this, maybe more, you know, covertly or overtly, um, who knows, but I, you know, like there, there was a cost and risk of being who we were and show how much we showed of who we were and what our families were like and what traditions we had. And um, at the same time that we can be in these spaces where it was powerful and beautiful and so comforting and safe. And Matthew, I just wanna say like what you shared is really powerful because like, even though we know that we have this safe space in the midst of this violence that we're experiencing as children, right? Um, that we're still, having to go through this process of understanding what our experience was and feeling powerful about our experience. And that's a big piece for me about heritage and culture is finding a community of folks that help me understand this narrative, you know, humanize the story and the struggle my family went through and my, fa my parents went through, um, understanding why I experienced all of this at some point and you know, I think about that a lot too, again, with my daughter, like at a time where, you know, there, there's an element out there that um, wants to take, doesn't value that type of education and that type of community building, that um, it's so essential that these stories get told. And um, I just want to thank all of you all for, for being vulnerable and sharing that. Yes, thank you so much. Steve, um, you mentioned um, talking to your, your children about you know, what your, your culture and heritage means, and especially uh, the more negative aspects. Um, those of you who are, are parents, and I think that's, that's most, most of everybody here, um, how are you talking to your children about uh, the costs of your, your upbringing, uh, the experiences that you had, um, the good ones as well as the bad ones? And on the flip side, do you have conversations with your, your parents uh, the older generation about uh, the experiences that you had growing up? And is that conversation different with each, each generation, the older versus the younger? I'll jump in if that's okay. I just saw, I just saw you. <laughs> yeah, we needed a moment to think about it. <laughs> no, um, so I, again, you know, I've been having these conversations a lot lately with my with my daughter, my son, he's two, you know, it's there, there isn't really having that deep conversation. 
Um, Just talking about goldfish crackers. Goldfish is very popular in this yeah. house. <laughs> um, or goldfish are grammar. Anyway, um, but I, you know, throughout the course of the pandemic also, you know, I've been making more of an effort to to reach out to both of my parents so my my father's filipino my mom is is american um a lot of european descent there's a lot of sorting out in there <laughs> um i'm pretty sure there's you know polish and czech um but yeah it's it's been interesting how that that dialogue has changed over the years um, so with my parents, you know, time, time is, is the great healing factor. Um, but time is also, is also valuable for gaining insight and retrospect. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's been very interesting over the years, you know, my, my, cultural dialogue with my father has has deepened a lot be, by my, because of my own journey within my own identity um learning more about the history of the philippines its relation to its relationship with the united states the positives and negatives of that um and coming to more of an understanding about, you know, parenting and uh, the choices that we make as parents. And then kind of on the flip side with my mom, um, it's, it's been very interesting because, you know, my, my mom has dealt with some level of, of discriminatory bullying. You know, my mom's hard of hearing and she's in, and her parents were practicing Jews you know, so there, there was an element of that in her childhood. Um, but one of the things that I've always tried to point out to my mom, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, it depends on how eloquent I am <laughs> and how upset I may or may not be in the moment. Um, but trying to remind her that it's kind of hard to see somebody's religion, but it is impossible not to see that my face looks like this or that my skin looks like this and so you know explaining things that my mom would say or and being like mom you know I, I you're an older generation I understand like different time and different expectations but you know we we got to learn to to view this and and try to understand how your kids are feeling you know I'm the oldest of three and even within my brothers and I, we all had wildly different experiences because we, none of us have the same skin shade, you know, like I'm the darkest of my brothers. Um, so I pass the least. <laughs> um, but in, in processing all of that, the way I've given it to my daughter has been, you know, I, the past, I mean, she was born just, you know, a week or so, two weeks after inauguration in 2017. And so there were obviously a lot of feelings surrounding the, the discourse around, around where America was at that point in time. And um, there's been a lot of discussion over the past several years that, you know, she, you know, she's getting ready to go to kindergarten. Well, just so you know, there will, there might be people that say certain things that are mean based on what your last name is. You know, if you choose to say Munesis versus Munesis, if you choose to, um, if you choose to be proud and say that you're, you know, you're, you're proud of your dad for, for this thing that he did, or, or this book that you're reading or something that you're working on, or, you know, you accidentally say something in Bisaya, you know, I, I, I was, I was prepared for that. My dad made a point to prepare me for that. And, you know, I mean, it, it just, I, I, the sports analogy, you can scrimmage all you want, but it doesn't prep you for the game. Um, 
you know, it, it helped to get my mindset ready for what, for what that the discrimination would be like, but, um, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't fully prepare you. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's that there, I don't know what more to say about that, but there's that element to it for, for me, at least as a parent. Ling, Laura, do you have any thoughts? Um, on this question, uh, the intergenerational dialogue about your, your culture and your heritage? I don't really have any conversation with my elders about this. For one thing, we don't live together in the same country, you know, the miles apart. But in terms of my son, mm -hmm. I have to say he's seven years old, so we can't really go too deep into a discussion like this. However, um, you know, through the Chinese lessons is, is a way to, of indoctrinating him that, you know, he is equal but different, right? At the same time, you know, he's born American, but he also has a heritage in him. Um, but what I am grateful for is the school that he's in right now, where it's a really small population. He doesn't, thankfully, he did not have to go through what Laura and Junaid, you know, had to go through, um, you know, and the school is very um, mindful about teaching their students about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he's growing up in a very protected, safe environment. But at the same time, I, I wonder if I throw him out to the bigger school mm -hmm. system, is he going to survive? I don't know. Um, there are many friends who tell me that, oh, you're so fortunate that he doesn't look very Asian or, you know, he looks really mixed. Yeah. So nobody could really quite place him, but he's really not Asian, but he's probably not, not American, but he's He's okay, is the way he kind of phrase it to me. But, um, but what I try to do as a parent to hopefully ingratiate, right, the future generation is that I volunteer in the school for lunch and recess duty. Thankfully, I'm able to take my mask off now and they can see that I'm pure Chinese. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for these little kids to kind of grow up, you know, knowing that he is a kind, you know, Asian lady who comes and look after us and who, you know, tends tend to our needs during this one hour, you know, that I'm hoping that to, to kind of give this, this future generation that, that sense that, you know, we are just like you, that I'm just like you, that our race is just like you. We are here to help one another out to build this community together. So um, that's about, ah, uh, hi. <laughs> So I, I hope that answers your question, Tish, on, on how I'm giving, you know, having a conversation with not just my son, but also with, you know, <clears throat> other boys and girls, you know, of the future generation. Yeah, I think for me, Tish, um, my dialogue with my kids are different than my father. And, um, you know, I put myself back in my own shoes when I was their age, I really didn't care too much about like our history and our culture and all that. It wasn't until I got a little bit older and it wasn't until probably 10 years ago when I discovered this entire history of my background. And, and um, it was only by coincidence that my husband had to write a project for his book report. I mean, his uh, like finals or his elective class or something. And he had to interview someone from out of the country. And he's like, well, I'll interview you. And I said, oh shoot, I don't know anything about my history. you know. And so, so then I called my father and I said, dad, um, you have to tell me a little bit more about, you know, where we came from, who are we and all of this. And he just, there was a pause on the other end. And the only thing that he did was here's a phone number. And he gave me a phone number that led to a lady that I hadn't talked to in 35 years. Apparently she was one of the sponsors that sponsored us to come to America. She was one of the committee members. And so I called this number. It went to a lady in Kingsport, Tennessee. And I'm like, hello, can I speak to a Jane? And she, She's like, this is Jane. I said, this is Nippapon. And she just started like bawling on the other end. And she was just like, I could hear her voice shake like Nippapon. Oh my goodness. You know? And, and so she's like, let me go through my attic. I have a box full of information that I have to dig up. Give me your address. Like a week later, 
she sent me this package of information that had newspaper clippings, my refugee paperwork, my picture that I have in front of my book as a malnourished child um, in the refugee camp holding my sign. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, it was almost like reading from someone else, not about my own self. I felt like I was looking, I just bawled my eyes out when I realized this was me. And so finally, when my dad came over, I said, okay, we got to talk. <laughs> Come here, sit down. What's going on? You know, and so I pulled out my recorder. I said, you're getting old, dad. I said, I need to know our history. And this was when this two hours long of emotional outburst of everything that he's ever been through from our, the war, how, um, you know, the, the war that, you know, the communists invaded our country after the Vietnam War, the nine years of bombing, him being held in captivity, and him, his escape story to our us living in the refugee camp to us coming to America, homeless, malnourished, unable to speak English in the middle of the dead winter storm with just our so sandal shots, you know, socks, tennis shoes on coming to Elgin. Um, uh, and so that was what I uncovered when I finally sat down and talked to my dad. And it dawned on me that the reason why it was never really brought up too much was because the emotional sense that he's tied, still tied to it. Because he choked up a few times and I said, dad, just take your time, you know, and just telling me about how my uncle was buried alive in front of the villagers and my other uncle was shot to death and, you know, and just the emotional, um, trauma that he had went through. And so it took me two hours, but I said, dad, just take your time. And that's how I got, you know, the most part of my book was through his stories and him sharing that. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping that when, as my kids get a little bit older, um, that I'm able to at least leave my book to them, read my book, you'll hear the history of our generation. But also I try to involve them into different cultural events in Elgin and, you know, have them involved in different things that we do here. Do you remember experience. any of your uh, your childhood experiences or was this before oh, yeah. you were born? <laughs> oh my gosh, should you ask? <laughs> so my, I grew up um, right down the street from the Y. There's like a Mexican store there across the street from the old Elgin High School. And um, so it was like everyone that came, all the Laotian that came to Elgin, we all congregated in the three blocks radius around that area. I mean, some were a little bit further, but I remember as a refugee child, I was like just roaming the neighborhoods of Elgin and like barefooted, dirty. We'd play with the marbles on the dirt. We'd play with the jump rope, the, the string tie. Like we still carried on the Lao traditions. And, you know, and so one of the things that the funny story as, you know, we're talking about that, but um, it's just the ignorance of being a child in America and just not really knowing the American custom, right? And so we were just probably used to like being in the refugee camp and all the helpers giving us food. And like, you know, we're just take whatever you, if you're hungry, you know, take whatever, you know, you, you can. And so coming here, like we love crab apples, like Lao people, we love crab apples and the sauce. And so anytime we see a crab apple tree in the neighborhood, we would just go in someone's yard. And so I remember as a child, love climbing trees. So if I like walk in the neighborhood and there's a fence, I climb the fence and I was a tomboy. So I would climb the apple tree and have a bag with me. And as a little kid, you know, putting in apples and almost always if the homeowners were home, they'd come and throw their, come out running, chasing after me and throwing their sandals at me. I'm like, these people are so mean, but I didn't know I was stealing from them. <laughs> You just wanted the crab apples. Just the you crab just wanted apples. to eat those. Yeah, and the Nor you know. Oh, and then the Mexican store. We live right next to the Mexican store, right there on South Chapel Street. And my cousins and I, we would also go in there, and you know, the candy and stuff. We get whatever we want, and we just leave. We didn't know we were stealing. We didn't know the English language, and so. But always the little kid, like their their kid worked there too. He would chase us, and we thought it was a game. So we just like. Oh, here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> what an ex gosh Run that is all awesome. the time <laughs> that's so funny and laura thank you for sharing you know part of your history and your background and your stories from being a little kid and you know in referencing what you said earlier about bullying when you were in school you know the kids who threw those spitballs 
I bet not many of them are published authors now. And Junaid, you know, the kids who made you feel isolated. I bet they're right. not big time attorneys as oh. judges now. So you're also accomplished. And this is really fun to get to hear your stories. And now I'm, we're going to skip a question because I think we already covered it. So my next question for the panel is, do you speak your native language? Laura, can you say something in your native language? Sure. Um, one of the common um, word is, hi, how are you? And it's sabaydi. And then we typically greet you like this with the sabaydi. And, um, you know, the counting is like, nung song sam si hat, one, two, three, four, five. You know, so it's very similar to the Thai language too. Like, so Thai is nung song sam si hat. You know, so Laos is Nung Song Sam is just like kind of dialogue because Laos and Thai are very similar. Great. Um, who else would like to jump in and answer that question about your native language and if you speak it? Matthew, you touched on it before. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> um, it's it's a slow process. Um, but yeah, I, I'm learning Bisaya, um, which is so the Philippines is a massive archipelago, 7,000 plus islands. Um, and there are seven major dialects, seven major language uh, languages. And so uh, my, my father was born in Bohol, which is a, an island in the central Visayas region uh, of the Philippines. And he grew up uh, in Bohol and Cebu. Uh, so I'm learning Cebu uh, Bisaya Cebuano. So it's, it's you know, kind of a, a, kind of a sub-dialect. Um, and even, even further, like when I'm talking to my dad, I'll ask him, you know, like one of the, th one of the most frequent things that I say to my dad, unsa un pagsulte, uh, whatever, sa Bisaya, you know, I'm just asking, how do you say this in Bisaya? And he'll be like, you know, he'll say, oh, you say this. Or in Boholano, which is even further sub-dialect, you know, again, because, you know, Cebu and Bohol are only, I think it's maybe an hour ferry ride uh, back and forth, but already even just that distance, you know, especially, I mean... It, it's becoming a little bit more fluid nowadays, all the dialects. Um, but be, because transportation is so much easier now than it was even 20 or 40 years ago. So, um, you know, one of the things that my dad talks about is like, you know, uh, English and then Tagalog, which is kind of a less formal version of the national language, um, the national language. Uh, are more common, you know, and like even some of my cousins, like one of the things my daughter says is how how to say I love you is gihigog makita, right? And uh, one of my youngest cousins, who's only a couple of years older than my daughter, uh, she had to ask my my auntie. She said, "What what does that mean, mom?" <laughs> and my dad was like, "Yeah, she it's too deep. It's too deep bisaya for for them because it's just not something that they frequently say." Um, but for greetings, you could say "kumusta," uh, and you know the the response would be, you know, "kumusta" is just like it's similar to Spanish because of mm -hmm. the colonization of Spain, uh, but it's not. John Oliver just had a, a great segment about the Philippine elections, which happened yesterday. And it's not como esta, like it's not como esta, but it's como esta. Um, and that's kind of, hello, how are you? And then, you know, the response would be like, I'm, I'm good. Well, thank you. That's awesome. And Junaid, how about you? हाँ तो मुझे थोड़ी सी उर्दू आती है लेकिन जब मैं उर्दू में बात करता हूँ तो वो अंग्रेजी के तरह से आवाज आती है so that means uh, I speak Urdu but I speak it with an American accent and I didn't realize that uh, until I was like uh, 21 years old and uh, I went back home for a visit my cousins were just they were 
laughing so much at me. Uh, like, you know, like literally, like I got off the plane, got to my relative's home, and I was trying to impress them with my Urdu. And uh, and they were giggling and giggling. And uh, I said, am I saying it wrong? And they're like, no, 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 you're, you're saying it right. But you, you don't sound like an Indian, you sound like an American who learned how to speak Hindi or Urdu. And uh, so, yeah, I, I can speak it, but uh, n- nobody's ever going to, if, if I'm on the phone, they're going to be like, oh, oh in <laughs> fact, uh, I was at a hotel and uh, uh, it was Christmas day and I called down to get something. Um, and I mean, they're like, this dude is clearly, you know, like from America and he's like using, you know, our, our custom, our language. They're like, oh, Merry Christmas, sir. I mean, Christmas is not a holiday there, but like they just assume like this dude must be from America. Yeah, so, they, you know, they it's gotcha. Christmas day. Well, I sure wouldn't have known. I thought it sounded great. That was that was fun to, to hear it. Thanks for, for sharing that with us. And uh, Steve, how about you? My first language is essentially English. You know, so my mother at home spoke to me in Korean or my parents did. Um, sometimes in English, I think a lot of that was pressure to probably want us to assimilate uh, more effectively in the school. But, you know, I, English is my first language. It'll be the first language for my daughter. Um, we teach her, you know, some Spanish, Tagalog and Korean words um, just because it's important to us. We hope that she gets immersed in the language some more. Um, a lot of that happens through grandparents, um, too. And so, you know, it's definitely culturally valuable to us. Um, we hope it's something that she pursues, but um, by and large, other than ordering when I'm out or, you know, respecting my elders and uh, my truest proud moment was being able to haggle at a Korean grocer for, for a table I wanted to buy and go through that <laughs> negotiation. Like that's, that's about the level that I can do, but I'm, I'm probably firmly in a elementary school level. Um, Speaking. Well, did, did as you long as you table? got a good deal on the table. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I did. I was very proud of that moment. Nice. Can you say something for us in Korean? I'm good. Or you're good. I, why don't you uh, just tell us in Korean? I'm not paying that for that table. <laughs> I'm all right. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great story. Yes. Ling, how about you? Ah, uh, um, I like to think that money is really interesting. So contrary to popular belief, uh, people always think that Singapore is part of China because m- m- the predominant race in Singapore is Chinese. But Singapore is really made up of, it's a, it's a, it's a multicultural country. Um, we were colonized by the Brits. And so we learned the Queen's English or the King's English. We take the examinations and also the GCE O levels and A levels. Um, so English is really our native language, but, but based on our race, we will have to learn a second language. And typically that second language will be what's our race language. So our learn Mandarin and the Malays will learn Malays and the Indians will learn Tamil for the most part, because this is where most of them migrated from the Tamil region. And then we have the mix, the Caucasians and they just stick to English. But we have to um, pass our second language before we can move to the next grade. So you have to pass English and you have to pass the second language before you can go on the next grade. If you ace your English and you don't ace, or if you don't even pass your second language, you, you, you are retained. <laughs> so, but, but interestingly, um, Singapore is such a hodgepodge of culture. We sort of and it's a fusion, you'd say. So we started creating our own language that we call Singlish. And it's, my husband loves to make fun of it and he even master it. So a lot of things will end with la and yeah, yeah, and all that. So if we were to have a conversation, just say something to me, one of you. I just, I would, let's try to have a conversation. I'll give an idea what, what it sounds like. What's for dinner tonight? Ah, let's see. Uh, maybe we will have chicken rice. And then you, you know, you'll see that, that accent coming in. Mm-hmm. And that's how my friends and I will, will kind of lapse into that when we're all together and we'll just be joking. We'll kind of go back into our singlish way of speaking. And we laugh at it because we miss it so much. It's just such an identity of Singapore. Um, if, if I, I put in the chat box um, that if
You're it's muted, muted. Ling. So in the YouTube, uh, in the chat box, I, I put in the who names um, that's very popular in YouTube. Right now is Ronnie Chang. He was um, a correspondent, right, at The Daily Show. Um, he has his own stand up right now and he will and he's from malaysia so we're very close of a country together and they cannot speak like us and we like, like them and that's uncle roger he, he's a malaysian living in uh, england and he has his own comedy channel so, and, and he'll hear you hear words like ah yeah you know it's the way of it's, it's, it's the exclamation saying oh oh dear you know <laughs> so, teaching people how not English. to cook rice Yes, yes, exactly. Be careful <laughs> about your fried rice. MSG too, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh. yes, so that. Does anybody have any other thoughts about uh, heritage languages or uh, shall we move on to what will probably be our last question because we're coming up on eight o'clock and we want to be respectful of your time. question okay uh, i would just like to ask what experience has had the most impact in making you the person that you are today so what experience has had the most impact in making you the person you are today anyone <laughs> any whoever would like junaid would you like to go first yeah um so again like you know like uh I, I view my my life as very, very positive. I mean, I have many, many, uh, you know, happy memories um, and they are rooted in uh, like, uh, like, you know, growing up in an Indian culture and a, a sub community. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, um, the, the, the choices that I've made, the career path that I've had in social justice um, is uh, a, completely colored by or uh, predicated on the negative experiences that I had. I mean, like I chose to become a public defender and then work in immigrants' rights and civil rights uh, entirely based on the, you know, experiences of discrimination that I went through with a, a very conscious mindset that, you know, like I, I, I've walked in this path and uh, I would like to make sure that I dedicate myself to uh, helping others who might experience the things that I did because um, early on after after you know I finished school and after I finished law school uh, I had a conversation with my parents um, and you know like uh, Growing up as an immigrant, you know, you have a lot of conflict uh, potentially with parents, at least I did about, you know, on the one hand, I talked about how, you know, growing up in the, the Indian community was like the safe space. But at the same time, there were a lot of things that, you know, my parents wanted us to do or wouldn't allow us to do uh, because they said, you know, that's well, that's that's not our way. And there was a lot of conflict over that. Um, but it was in my young adult life. Uh, you know, finally having that adult conversation with my parents and I, and I was, you know, relating some of the things that I, and, and I, and I said, well, you don't realize, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened. And a uh, very sobering moment was they said, no, we're, we, we, you know, and, and, and they got very emotional. And they said, we, we know those things happen and we're sorry we couldn't do more to stop it. But like, you know, we didn't know how. So I would say that, yeah, th those experiences have um, impacted me the most. You've certainly made a, a career, a, a successful career in social justice and as a practicing attorney and advocating for the Muslim community as well. So uh, our experiences do shape us. Um, who would like to go next? I second that one. <laughs> it, it really does. Um, so my story actually took a a different turn. Um, although I was really tight knit with my community growing up, that's all I really knew was the Lao traditional culture and everything and getting bullied by my American friends and teacher. But then as I got older, it kind of took a full turnaround because as I got older and I became more and more Americanized, then it, the opposite happened. And then I started getting bullied by some of the people in my own community, you know, oh, you don't want to be like us anymore. And oh, you're too, you know, you're too good, or you're being someone else, you don't want to 
take on the traditions anymore. And, um, and it, it, it was even worse because back then racism was, was very, it was much um, greater than probably what it is today, like, especially in the African American community. And so, you know, this was like, probably 30 something years ago. And so I ended up dating in Elgin High School, I ended up dating an African American kid and, and I just started getting bullied and, and lover and like, my Lao community would call my house, like, just really like, bully, like prank calling me going off on me. And so I was a very troubled teen of, I was going through like, um, just a mistaken, like just a, um, my identity crisis. I didn't know who I was, who I belonged to. And that caused a lot of stress. I was a troubled teen. I hardly went to school. I barely made it, you know, graduated high school. I ended up becoming a runaway, teenage runaway. I ran away about at, at the age of 15. I ran away into the loving arms of a black family in Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> And I was raised in an all black neighborhood, all, you know, uh, all black school. And, but like the family just cared and embraced me. And I, I don't know. And I felt like that really helped shape me because they loved me for, you know, who I was and it didn't matter. And the mom that, you know, that took me on as a guardian, she was like, you are beautiful. You're, you know, and so she showed me how to become the confident person and she gave me the backbone. And then when I think about it, when I look back now that I know my history, now that I know all of that, I understand now why my parents couldn't be the parents that I needed them to be. It's because of their own upbringing. My mom being a refugee person, you know, refugee coming to America, she didn't know how to raise an American, Asian American child into the strong successful person that I am her just having like a kindergarten graduation I mean kindergarten education and not barely surviving herself and having me to translate with everything and helping her to survive in America like how could she teach me and train me to be the successful person that I am and I think that right there just really truly shaped me into who I am and really just finding my voice and loving myself, having that backbone to stand up when I need it to, and just really like just embracing who I am and just loving who I am and not let other people define who I am because those naysayers that, you know, in my high school years, they told me I was going to not amount to anything. My future was a failure. I was a lost cause. Like as a teenager, that's what I went through. And, you know, I'm, proud of where I am because of the struggles that I went through and you know just leaving my multiple mul uh, multiple six-figure income job in 2019 like for someone to come from nothing you know growing up in public aid a single mother on welfare to like using her struggle turning my pain into purpose and using my struggle as a stepping stool to get me to where I am today, the stones that people were throwing me, it was just building my brick, brick by brick, and, you know, and helping me to get to where I am. And that's what shapes me. If I wow, could. that's an amazing story. And of course, if you want to hear more of, of Laura's riveting story, May 24th, she will be uh, telling her story at the library uh, and signing copies of her book. And I believe the program starts at 7 p.m., right? 7 p.m.? Yes, I think around yes, 7 to 8. That, yeah, that's <laughs> correct. Yeah. So please join us. Um, I will shamelessly promote all of you. <laughs> um, who would like to go next? I, I wanted to kind of jump on onto what, uh, onto what Laura was saying. Um, several, actually, uh, this, this is built kind of on, on two pillars of what Junaid was saying and what Laura was saying. Uh, I'll start with most recent first, you know, I, I grew up in Decatur, Illinois. Um, it, it's a relatively rural community, um, but demographically it is pretty evenly split between white and black communities. Um, very small, uh, you know, Filipino community. I like, I remember at some point when I was in high school, actually looking at the statistics for, for my high school, for Eisenhower, and I think it was like less than a percent. Uh, you know, I think there were maybe, it was like 45% uh, white, 45% black, 4% Latino, and then, you know, 1% uh, Asian Americans. 
and you know there were some some Chinese heritage kids there were some Japanese heritage kids and then I was the only Filipino kid um and one of the things that that uh influenced the the path that I took was you know I so I'm a musician um I I'm a I'm a jazz musician um as part of the discourse has been like jazz is black american music jazz is america's classical music as winton might say but um you know it, it jazz is is black american music it is it was uh it was born out of the struggles of of slavery and and built on on the legacy of black americans um and i you know even though you know part of the part of the dialogue from uh, from especially Asian immigrants, especially also into larger cities in America, like my my dad and many many of his relatives immigrated around the '80s. My dad immigrated to Baltimore and experienced some of his most traumatic race. Uh, racial discrimination from from the African American community. And so there's like a built up resentment of that previous generation. Um, and it, it's it's unique and and interesting that that was the community that I resonated with the most uh, as a teenager and also just in general. Um, you know, it that you know i i rarely had to explain why i was proud about things that i was proud about i rarely had to explain um what i what i meant by anything that i said or did because they understood that it was just part of who i was and that's where i was coming from and you know, I, re I reciprocated because, you know, Black culture is also American culture. Um, it's not the only American culture, obviously, but, you know, it is integral. Um, and so that that is obviously a large part of who I am and what I do. Um, and one of the interesting things that we've talked about that or the, one of the interesting aspects of things that we've talked about is, is language. And, you know, NPR has this whole like code switch podcast or, or show or whatever it is. Um, and I've, I've tried to explain this to many of my friends, like, especially that I went to college with that I, I speak and interact differently depending on who I am, who I'm talking to and how comfortable I am with the people that I'm talking to. Like, you know, I, I will speak more eloquently if I'm in certain situations. I will be a lot looser in other situations with, with like my accents and my inflections. Um, and that, that also translates into my family, you know, um, probably my parents and my family here hear the, hear the most authentic version of what I sound like. And my Filipino relatives hear the more Filipino version of me, you know, and, you know, friends that I grew up with will hear the more, you know, the more uh, urban, <laughs> you know, like, just the ebonic side of of that language um and you know that obviously all of that in influences a lot of the choices i made and then also you know like junaid was saying the the injustice and the racism and the negative experiences that that i suffered you know i i'm not gonna pretend like like anything that i dealt with was necessarily worse than anything that anybody dealt with, you know, um, especially because like I grew up, I, I'm only 32. I grew up in the nineties. Like it was relatively tame, <laughs> you know, I mean, like my, my, my dad will tell me stories and be like, well, this is why I feel a certain way about like this group of people 
because I saw them do these things. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't see that as often as you. Um, but I, you know, I did get, I did get called Jackie Chan and I got called an Indian, like by people that didn't realize that there's a difference between people from India and native Americans. Um, you know, and, um, you know, all sorts of things. And like, to the point where PE, my freshman year of, of high school, I, I don't even, I don't even remember what triggered the, this interaction. We were playing some sport and I got picked up from behind and just slammed on my neck. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm alive, so we're cool, but you know, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, those types of things, you know, stick with you and, um, but, but to the, to the point of social justice, you know, one of the things that is, that's been, uh, ever present in, in my mind has been the intersection of what I do, which is an admittedly limited scope, you know, I, people, uh, you know, we, we say that music has the power to touch to touch people's hearts and minds, but it, it's a little bit more limited when you're not singing, you know, I ain't Olivia Rodrigo or anything, <laughs> um, you know, but um, I, you know, I, I try to use that as a, as a forum to, to share the intersection of, of my advocacy for Asian Americans and for people who share cultural ties with me. Um, which is it just spread out, right? You know, the Philippines is is inherently uh, diasporic to uh, Spain and China. So there's a lot of there's a lot of the connections run very deep, and but also to to the to the black community here in the United States who who suffer a lot of similar prejudices and um stacked decks that um that many colonized uh ma many colonized territories have had to deal with um it's interesting how as the generations move away from that immigrant generation that it's art and literature that then begins to to tell the story uh we haven't heard from i believe steve and did I miss Ling as well? Ling. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Your, the experiences that, that shaped you? I can hop in. I can't speak to the single most important thing, but- uh, Or a type of experience? Think about traditions and rituals. I think it's important to always evoke the folks who are mentors along the way. That's something I hope to pass on to my um, daughter. And so in my final year of undergraduate at University of Michigan, I happened to decide I'm gonna take some Asian American studies courses, because why not? I'm Asian American, might as well see what it's all about. Maybe it'll be an easy A. Little did I know that I would meet um, Scott and Emily, um, teachers of Asian American history and Asian American creative writing course. That really changed my life. Um, they helped me understand my history. A lot of what's being shared here about like, understanding the experiences we've been through, the joys and the struggles, thinking critically about them, how it changes how we look at our family, how it changes how we look at our community, how it makes us feel more powerful and connected to a rich legacy that isn't just like this legacy of, you know, what happened in homelands or motherlands, but also the struggle and the triumph and the resilience of being here in the States. Um, these two individuals, now friends, really set me on that trajectory to become a community organizer, which I was for many years prior to having this position. And so, um, you know, to take it really quick back full circle to like, I think about everything as a parent now, and less so selfishly about me, maybe, um, that, you know, our, our children, um, we've been through a lot. And some things have gotten better and some things haven't, to be honest. And I want my daughter to be able to love herself and her culture and her history fiercely, unequivocally, without ever having to experience any violence, whether it's institutional violence or interpersonal violence, no one getting picked up and slammed, you know, none of that happening. And in a moment where we're seeing 
a lot of violence on both the interpersonal institutional level, but we also have incredible things like the TEACH Act that recently got passed that's like mandating Asian American history and studies in, in schools. So like to me, it's really about um, the people you know, that's how I teach my daughter about her culture. It's Lola and Lolo and, and grandma and um, other community members who are chosen family, who are incredible. Um, there's, there's people who I think about that, that changed me as much as moments. Ling, what about you? It, Any you experiences know, like, that really shaped you? This is hard for me to, to answer because I I feel like I've been I've had it pretty easy. You know, I I felt kind of American when I was in Singapore because we get all these shows from America and I, and I watch them and I feel like I know America so much. And I come here and I have no no incidents, no episodes of racism, unlike some of you. Everybody embraced me and made me feel welcomed and you know, through through school, through work. In fact, I remember very distinctly my first American acquaintance I met in university was a black girl, and and I know it's just a difference of colors at that time. I never knew about the history of black and whites in, in this country, but she embraced me, and she made me feel welcome as a freshman. And I I had nobody that I know in this big halls of, of the school that I was at, which was intimidating for someone who came from a small country. Then the second one who befriended me was a white American. So I felt I, I was embraced by all, you know, spheres of, of, you know, the faces of America. And I got into work. And maybe this might be the answer that it was work that shaped me. I was in journalism and I was lucky to be in journalism in a way because, you know, it's, it's a room full of, educated, liberal-minded, if you will, you know, minds that, that are just curious and welcoming. And I learned slang from them. I, I mean, I was a copy editor. I was really good at grammar and spelling and punctuation, et cetera, et cetera. But they're the ones who really taught me the nuances of America and they helped shape me into the American I am today. So I suppose, you know, that, that might be that formative um, episode, you know, part time in my life that 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 shaped me for, for the rest of my journey here. Punctuation and grammar are very important. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. important. Did you see the memes? I, I just have fits every time I see those memes. I and my friends just make fun of me or send me all the bad memes with the bad punctuation of the it's and the possessive and the non. And they just know it rattles me so much. Does anybody have any final thoughts about uh, heritage, customs, traditions? I just wanted to jump in one. Uh, Steve, Steve mentioned mentors. And I just want to shout out. I, I don't know if they'll ever see this. They probably they might not. I don't know. Um, but in in terms of helping in terms of helping move move me and move the conversation forward give me things to think about to talk to my family to talk to my my parents my daughter my son my wife um two have been very important and uh they're also i mean man they're just heavy hitters for me and just in in music in general, but uh, Miguel Zanon, uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to fail with that. Um, and, you know, I, I've been in touch with him for over 10 years now. I wrote my master's thesis on his music. Um, and this record that he released in 2014 called Identities Are Changeable was so immensely powerful. I, I still remember I got the, like I got the CD in the mail. Uh, this was before my kids were born. This is 2014. So I was driving just, I was driving to Schaumburg just to drive. And I had to like pull over because I was just, I, I just started crying because it had interviews intercut with, with the music. 
And I like, it just, it, it hit me so, so hard because, you know, Miguel's Puerto Rican and there's a lot of shared history between Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Um, and uh, through the U S <laughs> um, but it was so powerful to hear these people get ready to born on the island or born to born to two Puerto Ricans, but grew up in New York or grew up in Massachusetts or wherever. And how, how strongly they connected with the culture, how, how powerful the culture was for them to help define who they are and how they feel about themselves. And that was huge for me because if I don't hear that record, there's, there's, very you know i mean i would probably have still come to this eventually but it it inspired me to 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 make that greater effort to to tie myself to to my family and tie myself to to that ancestral history and then also john arabagon who uh i mentioned earlier in my story talking you know he's 10 years older than me you know um, and, uh, also a first generation Filipino American, you know, and he has been instrumental in helping encourage the, the promotion and the, uh, the value of Filipino music. And well, Matt, Matthew, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And what a great way to celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month speaking with all of you and uh, letting us hear your stories. So thank you all so much for this engaging, interesting conversation. And uh, thanks for joining us for Open Book Asian Heritage. Everybody have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.